I'd like to finish our discussion of other gain enhancement methods. I'll talk a little bit about linearity um, of the um, differential pairs and the amplifiers. Um, and if I talk fast enough, I'll talk about offset voltages. So we made a statement that it can be shown that the feedback amplifier um, is usually stable even if the open loop amp is unstable. So how do we show that? Um, recall the numerator AB0 does not change signs when the cost term in the denominator transitions from positive to negative. If you look at our expressions here, on that numerator stayed at minus GMF1 if GMP1 changed signs from positive to negative. Uh, if if the, the constant term denominator changed signs from positive to negative. So, um, if you look at this amplifier structure here, and even though I'm only focusing on the simple structure, the same applies to a fully differential amplifier, and we can turn these into two stage amp op amps too. Um, so for um, somehow my fonts are proved up. <laughs> so the voltage gain of the structure, um, since the since um, it doesn't change the gain doesn't change signs at DC, it's a a b zero. Um, times the pole over S plus um, the pole for the pole positive, and it's minus A B zero times the pole of S plus the pole for the pole negative. Um, so the feedback gain looks like this. Uh, man, I don't know what happened to my fonts. Um, so it's A over 1 plus A beta. Um, and if you look at um, the pole denominator, um, the pole determined by the denominator, if um, the pole of the op amp is in the left hand plane and it's stable, the pole with feedback moves way out. That's why that gain bandwidth product was constant, because that feedback pole goes up to real high frequency. Um, if this quantity is negative, <laughs> then it gets multiplied by minus beta A B zero, and the pole still in the left half plane. So even though the open loop pole may go into the right half plane, you apply feedback, and the feedback pole is still in the left half plane. Um, so this shows pictorially what goes on then. Again, I apologize for the graphics. The pictures all the, not for the equation, but the but the graphics are all right. So here we have a left half plane open loop pole, small value, with feedback. Um, it moves out here someplace. If you have a right half plane uh, pole and fairly close to the imaginary axis, um, it moves out here someplace. Um, and the distance between those, where, where it was at it was the left half plane and where it was at the right half plane, is about twice the magnitude of that, that pole. So that pole could move a long ways in the right half plane, and still the feedback amplifier is going to be stable. If we moved it to 10 radians per second in the right half plane instead of the left half plane, and this pole is out here at a megahertz, and we shift it by 10 radius per second, we don't shift it hard at all, the feedback pole. Wow. So now we're in a situation where at least if that pole P1 is small in magnitude, it has almost no effect on the stability characteristics of the feedback amplifier. Is that interesting? I could challenge you to find papers by very well-known people that have made comments about the fact that you've got to be sure that pole, open loop pole doesn't move into the, into the right half plane. They probably haven't looked at this plot. Okay.
Now, I made a statement more than that. I said, not only will it be stable, not only can it be used to build a good feedback amplifier, I made the claim that it can even be a better amplifier if you push that open loop pole in the right half plane. So if you guys go to industry and design op amps with a pole, open loop pole in the right half plane, you may actually find that you get very good performance. People may question your sanity as to why you're putting that pole in the right half plane, but the customer will probably appreciate what it, what it does. So why? So here's a plot of the gain with feedback as a function of the pole location. And if that pole is at the origin, Oh, the, the, this is the plot of the step response, excuse me, as a function of the pole location. If the pole is at the origin, your op amp becomes an integrator. The gain is A0 times P1 over S. And the gain is in, DC gain is infinite. So you're, if you put a step in, the output will go to exactly one over beta at time t equals infinity. So here's what happens if you put the pole at the origin. It settles to the value you want. Now let's look at the settling time. Usually you have a situation where you would like the amplifier to settle to one over beta. That's what the output is supposed to be with feedback. Right? A, a, a feedback is one over one plus, it, it, is, is one over beta. So, if you put a unit step in, it should settle to 1 over beta. If the pole is in the left half plane, oh, and, he, and here's a settling window. So you can say mm -hmm. uh, it will be settled if it's within a certain uh, bound of the final, of the desired value. We'd like to go to 1 over beta. So this might be 1% below 1 over beta, this might be 1% above 1 over beta. Settling time is defined to be the time it takes to get into that subtle window. So, um, if the pole is in the left half plane, P1 is less than zero, it settles like this. And this is the time where it gets into that window. So this is settling time. If the pole is at the origin, it gets in that window here. A little bit sooner. If you put the pole in the right half plane, the output's going to overshoot. If the pole is left half plane, the output will undershoot. It will asymptotically approach a line below. If that pole open loop pole is the right half plane, it will asymptotically overshoot. And it will come up here. Now, if it overshoots by 1% or it undershoots by 1%, the effect of the system will be about the same. Right? But what's the settling time if it pulls the right half point? Faster. It's faster. It's when it crosses it's when it crosses this line and and, and that's fastest. Of course, if you push it too far in the right half plane, it will never settle into that window. But if you put push it too far in the left half plane, It will never uh, settle in that window either. Okay. So this is the argument that you can actually enhance performance. First of all, stability is not an issue. Bringing overshoot, um, peaking the gain response, feedback out for those are all non-issues. Whether you have the pole a little bit in the left half plane or a little bit in the right half plane. But settling performance can actually be improved a little bit. Uh, let me make a, a few comments about circuits that might have some, some interest.
We talk about gain enhancement by cross-coupling the output of that differential stage to get the minus V out term. We said that might be too much. So we said we could put an attenuator on. Attenuator might, might cause um, a fair amount of additional area to put the attenuator on. Um, what if we broke the counterpart circuit into two parts? Remember that counterpart circuit's a transistor. It has a certain width. So I could think of that counterpart transistor. If that counterpart transistor looks like this, it has some width W and length L. I could say that's equivalent to a transistor that's a width W minus epsilon in parallel with a transistor of width epsilon and length L. Make sense? Now what could I do? I wanted to get a small fraction of V out fed back to the input with an attenuator. What can I do? Use the smaller width one here and feed the cross couple V out to here. That does the same thing as the attenuator. I lost the ability to drive the counterpart circuit when I connected the output, the input to the counterpart circuit to the output of the upper, other side. If I do this, this output is available. So what can I do here? Connect, connect it to the end. So now I could, I could um, get a gain enhancement both ways. I can get a doubling of GM, which will drive my GB up, um, and I can get, drive my DC gain up as well. Of course, if we can do that with a counterpart circuit, we could also get some interesting characteristics if we looked at quarter circuits that had two inputs. And we could have circuits that had both two inputs on both the quarter circuit and the counterpart circuit. Here's another structure. Um, so what I'm going to do, this is, this is similar this is similar to um, splitting that transistor into two parts. But now I'm going to cross-couple a small transistor, well, maybe not necessarily small, Q3 and Q4 to get the minus GM term. And then I'm going to put a diode connector transistor in for the rest of it, GM5 or or, uh, Q5 or Q6. And you can show that the DC gain of this circuit um, has a denominator that's GM6 minus GM4. So now I can make those two GMs about the same, maybe make GM4 slightly bigger than GM6, and that will compensate for the, the sum of the output conductances. If you want to get accurately control of that gain to make it really big, it's going to take precise matching of the GM4 to the G out 2 plus G out 4 plus G out 6. But if the pole goes a little ways in the right half plane, it doesn't hurt us too much, maybe even helps us. Well, here's the one I just put on the board where we split the counterpart circuit into two parts and have part of it either going to VN or to a fixed bias voltage. Okay, so here's a, well, we start with the talent's copy cascode amplifier. And normally, we waste the input possibilities to the counterpart circuit. So here I put, I split it in two parts. So I can control the amount of, 
this sort of this is appropriate to use the term now. I'm providing, providing positive feedback to the counterpart circuit. When I put that my, minus V out in, I'm providing positive feedback to the hand signal. So here I'm cross coupling the cascode transistors, not the input transistors. Now, why am I cascoding? Why am I cross coupling cascode transistors? If I cross couple the input transistors, I get that minus GM term in the denominator. Remember, the cascode device, if you have a cascode configuration, your input is here, and this input has very little effect on the, the gain. This current here is approximately GM 1BN, right? If I cross couple the cascode device, I can get a little bit of effect, not a big effect. That means I don't have a great big minus GM term coming in. Denominator. Okay, so anyway, this is another way to um, enhance that gain without having that big GM term appearing. Cross coupled to the cascode devices. And I can provide the regenerative feedback now either place. I can provide the regenerative feedback to the counterpart circuit, or I can provide the regenerative feedback to the quarter circuit. This is just an analysis of that structure we just looked at. So if, a few comments. We've looked at several different ways in the last hour <coughs> at enhancing the gain and or enhancing the, the gain balance product. Um, significant gain enhancement is possible, but most generators avoid this regenerative feedback because of unfounded concerns about open loop stability. Accuracy and settling time can be improved with some regenerative feedback. We saw an example of that where we improved the settling time. Um, and why do we improve the accuracy? If you put the pole at the origin, you'll actually sell the one over beta. So I'll improve the accuracy as well. Um, I believe that these techniques may be more important to look at when we have continuous shrinking supply voltages. Because notice these regenerative feedback techniques did not require stacking transitions on top of each other. So we didn't lose the headroom um, that we lost with the cascode configurations. Um, regenerative structures can have high sensitivities. When you try to match a GM to some of G outs, it's pretty sensitive to the GM value. The signal swing is quite limited in some of the most basic regenerative feedback structures. We did talk about signal swing. You go back and look at those structures, and the signal swing may not be particularly attractive. However, since you can get so much gain enhancement and some GD enhancement by driving the counterpart circuit, if you use a regenerative feedback first stage, you don't need much signal swing. And so that seems like a reasonable input to a two-stage amplifier. So most useful, in a, I believe it's most useful in a two-stage amplifier where the signal swing is naturally low at the output of the first stage. Need to emphasize that we can combine um, all of these effects together. We can combine cascading, we can uh, um, combine regenerative feedback, we can combine cascoding, we can combine the regulated cascoding, we can combine the folding, um, we can combine all these effects together at the same time. So at this point, um, the most popular op-amp architecture I think have been introduced. 
Um, a large number of different architectural choices exist um, with substantial, substantially different performance potential. We saw a lot of different CD characteristics uh, of the different structures and some difference in GB efficiency characteristics. The choice of architecture is important, but oftentimes the, the, the clever use of your degrees of freedom um, is maybe more important on obtaining good design. Ironically, few architectures offer a GB power efficiency than that that's better than that of that first op amp we looked at, that reference op amp. Some variants of the base amplifier structures, such as buffered output stages, are commonly used in some applications. Our op amps that we looked at have all, all have a high output impedance. You can put that into a common drain stage and drive the output impedance way down. Even though it becomes then a three stage amplifier, if it, you start with a two stage, um, the poles of that output stage are usually at such a high frequency that it still acts like a two stage amplifier. So compensation is not a major problem with those. If you put a buffer on the output stage, what's the benefits of that? We looked at what happens if you drive resistive loads. If you drive a resistive beta network, what happens to your open gain? Even the simple, even the simple um, op amp has just a common source second stage. The loading of the beta network, if beta is not one, will oftentimes cause your gain to tank. If you go to a cascoded structure, which you don't often have to do on the second stage, but if you went to a cascoded structure, it would absolutely kill your gain, the loading of the beta network. You can put a buffer on. By putting a buffer on, that isolates pretty much the loading of the beta network from your amplifier stage. So if you want to provide resistive feedback, that's common. We'll find that a lot of switch capacitor circuits, we don't have the need for resistive feedback, and we'll find that these high output impedance transconductance stages work great. The switch capacitor circuits field, or the charge redistribution data converters, which use charge redistribution on capacitors don't need low output and soft amps because they're driving capacity loads. Considerably different insight can be obtained by viewing a circuit in multiple ways. I think we saw that when we looked at current mirror op amp. We saw that current mirror op amp was really the cascade of two amplifiers a low gain and a high gain stage. They really look like entirely different circuits, I think. Um, very systematic procedures for design op amps have been introduced. And I think you guys come up with new circuits yourselves by taking this quarter circuit approach and, and looking at different quarter circuits. Um, it's important to understand the design space and identify a good set of design variables. And I think we saw examples of that um, on Monday, um, we had really nasty expressions for most of the parameters of interest in the, in the op amp if we use the natural design parameters. Cascade amplifiers offer potential for gain enhancement, but compensation schemes to practically work with more than two poles um, have not really caught on. And regenerative feedback or positive feedback, um, I think there's a lot of potential for it. I don't think it's been it's been ferreted out very well yet. So up to this point, we focus primarily on characteristics of so either signal swing um, or or small signal performance. Um, linearity of an amplifier does play some role on the performance of feedback amplifier. Now you can show that if the gain is high enough, so the feedback gain is one over beta, then the linearity of the open amplifier plays no role. But if your gain is not quite high enough, 
then the uh, nonlinearity of the oval lamp amplifier will play some role on the linearity of the feedback network. When you start to go audio applications, when you're looking for 0.01% THD, um, you want to be sure that you don't introduce some nonlinearity because of the operational amplifier. Um, linearity is a major concern when the op amp is used open loop. We looked at open loop applications of the, of the OTA um, as well. Um, a major source of linearity, of, linear, of nonlinearity, often the dominant source of nonlinearity is due to the input stage. It seems like so many things on that overall amplifier structure are determined primarily by the input stage. If you lose it on the input stage, you never gain it back. And usually, um, things that happen that are undesirable in the outer stages, their effects are, are reduced by the gain of that first stage. So let's look at the linearity now of the differential stages. So signals, we've talked about signal swing so far when we've looked at common mode input ranges and so forth. And what we looked at is what it takes to keep the amplifier out of triode. But just keeping it out of triode doesn't mean we're not starting to have problems with linearity. Um, so some subset of the signal swing range will typically have reasonably good linearity. Um, often that subset is close to the entire input range of the device. So here's an ideal scenario. We have a, an input range where we operate and over that input range it's perfectly linear. But we know any amplifying device is going to saturate at extreme high or extreme low inputs. So this, is, this shows an ideal input range and an ideal um, output range. But here's what's going to happen. We end up with some nonlinearity um, in that structure. It typically gets worse as we go towards the, the saturation limits. I'm not sure that my, my picture depicts that very well. Modest not only throughout the input range, but the operation is quite linear over some subset, the subset typically in the middle of that range. So here's the signal swing um, range where we might have quite linear input. So um, here's our differential input stage to a single stage amplifier or two stage amplifier. And as, as I stated, the linear of the differential pair is a major concern. So let's look at the differential pair. I'll look at both MOS and bipolar devices. Here's the MOS differential pair. Got the two currents, ID1 and ID2. And the sum of the two currents is equal to the tail current. Um, I can solve the second equation for um, ID2 in terms of ID1, and I can write these two expressions. Um, and then I can take the difference of these two equations, and I can get the expression for the differential voltage VD. Now, VD is normally the input, um, but this, is, this differential voltage is a function of the tail current and the drain current. Now, if the current goes to a resistive load, we're going to assume that right now. So linearity is determined by the linear of the current. If it goes to a current mirror or something, the linearity of the current is still the major contributor to the overall nonlinearity. So this doesn't relate the output variable, the drain current, to the voltage. It relates the voltage to the current. I can solve that quadratic equation if I want to. Um, and get an expression for um, um, ID1 and ID2. Um, so let me first look at the structure. I'm not going to solve that. I, I, I could solve this equation for ID1, and I could solve this equation for ID2. It's not too hard. Um, what values of VD will call, cause all the current to be steered to the left or the right? So what happens on the structure is as we increase or decrease the differential voltage, we're moving more current to the left side or the right side. 
Um, and we can see from this expression here when that's going to occur. For example, when ID2 goes to zero, then all the current will be going to ID1. So if I put ID2 equals zero in this expression, I can find that the differential voltage is minus the square root of IT times the square root of 2L over mu C ox W. So a plus or minus value of that voltage will steer all the current to the left side or the right side. So are we with me? So now we know how much, and, and this defines the change in the differential voltage that will keep the devices operating in the saturation region. If I plot those two currents, those two currents look like this, ID1 and ID2. Um, they go to zero when the differential voltage is this much. They go to um, ID1 when the differential voltage is this much, and, and, and ID2 does the opposite. You can also show that when VD equals zero um, up there, you can solve that equation for ID2 or ID1, and you'll find they both go to the point I tail over two. So when the currents are I tail over two, it's splitting equally between the two sides. V excess bias, by definition, um, is the quiescent value of the VGS minus VT. So I can solve that. So I tail, stick this transistor here, the quiescent currents I tail over two. So I can say I tail over two is equal to mu C out W over two L times V excess bias squared. I can solve this equation for V excess bias and I can see it's equal to square root of I tail times square root of L over mu C out W. So if you look at this expression here, this is equal to, VDX was equal to, well, let's go back and look at what VDX was. We've got that value of VDX that steers all the current to one side or the other. And that was a square root of two, that was a square root of I tail times the square root of two L over mu C X W. So we see then that VDX, the differential voltage that steers it to one side or the other, is equal to plus or minus root two V excess bias. So I can relabel uh, my plots with plus or minus square root of two V excess bias. The reason I do that is what are the design variables we typically work with? Power and the excess biases, right? So this tells us right away then what the excess biases are going to do to the signal swing. Okay. So we conclude immediately that V excess bias affects linearity. If you have large V excess biases, we're going to have a large linear input range. And if we have small V excess biases, we have a narrow input range. Is that good or bad? Well, what do we have to do if we have to high gain? Tim. To get high gain, you have to have what? Low V excess bias. So we're going to high gain, we're going to have like signal swing. Oh, maybe that's not bad. Because if you high gain, you don't need much signal swing. Yeah, that's right. On any stage, for a certain signal swing on the output, the signal swing on the input is the signal swing on the output divided by the gain. So we don't need a lot of gain on uh, a lot of signal swing on the input to a high gain stage. So at least we have to find that affects linearity. If you want a large input range, which you oftentimes do for using a transconnect to amplify the open loop situation, um, then you probably won't have a, a high voltage gain. We don't care about the voltage gain when we're using an op amp as a transconnect amplifier, open loop transconnect amplifier. So for a transconnect amplifier, big V excess biases may be appropriate to get good signal swing. We still haven't looked at a metric for determining how linear it is. So I'm going to put a straight line through that, a tangential line. Um, ben, how much time do we have? Oh, uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes.
So I'm going to put a tangential line in there. And I'm going to ask the question, um, how big is the, well, it, it's pretty linear up to, up to here. So I'm going to see how big this, this point of intersection here is. Now it starts, to, it starts to tail off, this is not a sketch, this is a plot. So it starts to tail off about here, well it's tailing off all along, but it's really starting to get significant about two-thirds to three-fourths of, of this intersection point. So let's first get this intersection point here. So the fit line, is a form, let's point slope form of a line, m is a slope times the differential voltage plus h, which is the intercept, right? So I need to get m um, and um, h. In fact, when, when um, id is equal to zero, I'll get this intercept here. If this goes to zero, then bd will be minus h over m. Make sense? If I find the line, if I find m and h, then this voltage here will be minus h over m. When vd equals zero, we know the current is equal to i tail over two, and at vd equals zero, I can find the partial of I with respect to VD, and that will be the slope of the line. Make sense? Tangent line will be the slope at VD equals zero. Oh, and I know what the intercept is. When VD equals zero, the current is going to be uh, um, I tail over two. So H is I tail over two. So what do I need? I need H and M. So now I need to get the, sl the slope yet. Um, slope is partial ID with respect to VD, evaluated it at the Q point, which is, which is at VD equals zero. So here's the expression for VD. I can't easily take the partial of ID with respect to VD, but I can take the partial of VD with respect to ID very easily, and then the reciprocal of that will be what I want. So the partial of VD with respect to ID, um, this is your freshman calculus course. I want to evaluate the Q point, um, and it's equal to minus two uh, square root of L over mu cx W times one over the square root of the I tail. Um, so you can observe that that quantity, the square root of L over mu cx W, is, is equal to Vx's bias over the square root of the tail current. So partial of Id with respect to, to um, Ib is equal to minus 2 Vx's bias over It, and consequently the slope is minus It over 2 Vx's bias. Okay, simple calculation. Um, so now we just have to take uh, minus h over m, and we find that intersection point is Vx's bias. Okay? Let's look at, zoom in a little bit farther. So, what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is, as long as the differential input is less than the square root of Vx's bias, we stay in the saturation region. If it's less than Vx's bias, we're pretty linear. Let's zoom in a little bit farther and, and, and get a better metric of linearity. Now, if you have a feedback application, um, even if the input is Vx's bias, the differential input, um, there's not much nonlinearity in that amplifier. So I'm going to now look at how big the differential input can be for x percent deviation from a straight line. So the question is, um, if I want to have X percent deviation, how big is VD? It can be shown that 1% deviation from the straight line occurs at VD equals VX is bias over 3. 
So if you differential input is less than dx is bias over three, your deviation will be less than 1%. And 0.1% variation corresponds to a differential input of VXS bias over 10. If you have a high gain amplifier, a two stage amplifier, this is your input to your first stage, this is a dominant perturbative nonlinearity, and if the gain is, is 100,000, and the gain on the second stage is 1,000, then if your output signal swing is going to be 1 volt, then your output signal swing in the first stage is one millivolt, and one millivolt divided by 100 would mean your signal swing, your input, would be 10 microvolts. 10 microvolts. So how linear is this amplifier at 10 microvolts? We have, if Vx is bias with one volt, we have 0.1% deviation at um, 100 millivolts. If you go down to 10 microvolts, your amplifier is extremely linear. Make sense? Here's a plot that show or, or a table that shows. Um, how big the signal swing will be for given amounts of nonlinearity. Distortion in the differential pair is another useful metric for characterizing linearity with sinusoidal differential excitations. Um, So now I'm going to assume the differential input is a sinusoid. I'm going to find the total of my distortion in this differential amplifier. Um, so this is the relationship we had before. So the relationship between the differential input and uh, the current ID2. So now I put in um, Vm sine omega t for Vd. And now I'm going to solve this equation for ID2. I could have done it earlier. And so I can square both sides and, and just square it again. And this latter equation can be expressed in this form here. Um, ID2 squared minus ID2 ID plus theta dd squared um, minus it over 2 equals 0. Um, and I can solve this with a quadratic equation. And I get an expression for I2 as a function of, of vd. That's what I should have, could have done earlier. Now, if VD is reasonably small, I can expand this square root term in a Taylor series and truncate it after first order terms. And I can approximate this by one minus VD squared um, type one or minus this term over two, which is VD squared theta over four IT. So here's an approximate expression for ID2 that, that semicolon is just the equals, approximate equals. Um, note this term has no second order term. If you look at this expression for ID2, it has I, um, ID2, it has a VD, a constant term, that's a question term, and then it has a first order term which is what we want, and then it has a VD2 term. That means there's no second 
order terms present here? If there's no second order terms present, we will have no even order distortion, distortion terms in the spectral response. Oh, this is kind of tedious. I just plug in v, VD sine of omega t um, and square it, and that's sine squared of omega t, and there's a double angle formula and, and, a, and a third angle formula or whatever for that expression. Um, so I get an expression for um, I, ID that looks like, like this. And what we see is um, something times the sine of omega t, which is what we want, plus something times the sine of 3 omega t, which is what we don't want. So this is a distortion term. This is a linear term. Output's proportional to the input, and the output has the distortion term. So the, the distortion is characterized by the relationship between the magnitude of the, of the third harmonic compared to the magnitude of the fundamental. Um, in fact, this amplifier has only third order distortion. If we, if we trunk, I guess it's a consequence of truncating the Taylor series expansion at the end of the first order terms. Okay, so this of this form, um, A0 plus A1 sine omega t plus A3 sine of 3 omega t. Um, total harmonic distortion is approximately equal to the sum of the AK squareds over A1. Um, and if you plug in the values we had for, for A1 and A3, um, total harmonic distortion looks like this. Um, oh, this expression gives little insight. It's, it's a really a mess, isn't it? We analytically can calculate it. Um, let's go back to the practical parameter domain um, where the tail current now, I'm going to put tail current in this expression, is proportional to VXS bias squared. Um, and um, I end up with the total harmonic distortion expressed like this. So what do we see now? Total harmonic distortion is this relative a simple expression of the excess bias. And I put a table here for different values of VM or VM. So bias VM is a magnitude of sine wave, what the THD is. So if VM over VXS bias is 1, um, then the THT is minus 29 dB. That's not too bad. If VM over VXS bias is 0.1, THT is minus 70 dB. If it's 0.01, the THD is minus 110 dB. If we use this as a first stage of 2 stage amplifier, recall those signals that are going to actually be appearing in the input are going to be extremely small. They'll probably be well less than 0.01 um, times the excess bias which means that the amplifier is introducing almost no distortion in our feedback circuit. Make sense? If you want to minimize THD, if that's important, if it's not small enough already, um, all we have to do um, is make VF large and VM small. How do we make VM small? Two-stage amplifier feedback. Um, signal is going to appear at the differential input. It's going to be pretty small. How much time do we have left? Oh, uh, five seconds. <laughs> well, I'm fast, but not that fast. <laughs> so tomorrow morning, we'll... we'll did, did that die? Yeah. Yes. Perfect timing. Excellent timing. Yeah. It just died. <laughs> Who pulled the plug? <laughs> Are there any questions? 
So tomorrow morning we'll come back and we'll conclude our discussion of the, uh, of the linearity of differential stages looking at bipolar structures.